he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also bereth fruit and bringeth forth some of an hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Thank you, brother, so much, and it's so good to be with you all this morning, and such a blessing to be able to continue our study looking at his life, and we're focusing in on what is described as the kingdom parables, and uh, I know that we have studied this recently as a congregation, that is that topic, Larry did a thorough investigation of this topic uh, during a Wednesday night study. And uh, we are grateful to be able to have these types of lessons laid out for us by our Father, our Creator. Uh, and obviously, as His Son uh, is here upon the earth, they are being provided to mankind for our benefit so that we can understand the kingdom, so that we can understand what it means to be a part of and to have the Lord providing to mankind uh, his kingdom. Uh, there is no greater kingdom in the history of all the world than that of the kingdom of God. And you think about some kingdoms that have existed, you think about some uh, wonders that have uh, been constructed and have been sustained for a certain period of time, and it's a marvel to contemplate uh, kingdoms such as that of Rome, for example, uh, such as, of course, the United States. Uh, different aspects of these kingdoms, different traits of these kingdoms are indeed a marvel, but nothing compares to the kingdom of Christ. And when you think about how the kingdoms uh, of man were established, you think about things such as the Revolutionary War and uh, the United States, which eventually, of course, it became the United States, but the colonies as they were forming and as they were declaring their independence. And you obviously have the clash between Great Britain and uh, the colonies, which would eventually then form into uh, our country now today, the way that we operate, um, because we declared independence and then ultimately we won and were liberated from uh, the rule of Britain due to that Revolutionary War. It's a, it's a marvelous thing. And it was a, a great uh, event throughout all of history as to how this nation ended up being formed and how it ended up being uh, formalized in terms of uh, that event and that war that took place. But you think about the Lord's kingdom and how the Lord's kingdom was established. Uh, the Lord's kingdom was established because of the seed, because of the seed, because of his word. And it is sustained because of his word. There are no physical battles that take place. As a matter of fact, even in an instance where a physical battle was sought after by one of the disciples of the Lord, one of his very apostles, Peter, who drew a sword in order to defend Jesus as they came to arrest him in the garden, what did Jesus say? Jesus said to put away the sword. Uh, that's not how the kingdom of God is going to be formed, as we see throughout history. It's also not how the kingdom of God is sustained. We don't have events such as the Bay of Pigs. We don't have events such as the Vietnam War. We don't have events uh, such as 9-11 and then what took place throughout Afghanistan and throughout all the uh, the, the various periods and turmoils that have existed throughout uh, American history, for example. We don't have that in God's kingdom. Yet it is a greater kingdom. And, uh, and so what does that tell us? That tells us that the seed that we're going to study here this morning is extremely powerful. Why? Because it brought about the birth, and it also has continued to sustain the eternal kingdom, the kingdom of God. And so we're going to study the seed in particular this morning. We need to begin by noticing Luke's account of this parable. Uh, it was read Matthew 13 and verse 23 just a minute ago, but Luke chapter 8 has the same account. And in verse 11, we learn that the seed is the word of God. And so again, parallel this with... Lay this beside in, in, in your mind to great events in secular kingdom history. Uh, great battles that have existed. Great events that have taken place. Uh, great um, moments of, of tremendous engineering 
wartime political power that have come about. And contemplate those events compared to the seed of the kingdom. The Word of God. It is that much more powerful, yet from a paradoxical type view, it seems so insignificant. I mean, I mean, look at look at the seed. Look at the, the, the smallness that exists from a physical perspective as it relates to a seed. But that is what God has used. Uh, and yet its power is that much more mighty and is eternal. And so let's contemplate this seed. Let's begin by thinking about the seed's purpose. What is the purpose of of the seed. Remember the seed being the word of God, Luke chapter 8 and verse 11, the law of God, the commandments of God. Uh, Think about what the psalmist writes in Psalm chapter 19 and in verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The seed's purpose is to convert the soul, to bring the soul from a state of being lost from a state of being without God, from a state of being undisciplined, from a state of being uh, simple or foolish, to a state of being wise, of being converted, of being righteous and holy. God's Word provides us value. Paul will explain to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting there in verse 16, he says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, or all Scripture is god Breathe. The Word of God has been breathed by God. What we read in the pages of the Bible was given directly by God. He's given it to mankind. Every word is from Him. Well, what is it profitable for? What is it purposed for? What's the, the reason behind God giving this to mankind? For doctrine. That means for instruction, for teaching, for uh, guidance in terms of man's Lack of understanding. God has taught us in a formalized, framed way so that we can understand what we need to do as it relates to His standard for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The Word of God corrects man. The next time you hear of a passage or you hear of uh, God's Word, you read of God's Word, you study God's Word, and it cuts your heart, it challenges you, it makes you feel uncomfortable, you need to be reminded that is the very purpose of God's Word. It is to challenge us. It is to reprove us, to correct us, so that we can know how we ought to live. Verse 17, that the man of God may be perfect, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. How is it that we know to do good? How is it that we understand a proper standard, a proper system in terms of that which is good? Is it based upon our own feelings? Is it based upon social media posts? Is it based upon uh, whatever political leaders say during the, during the moment? No, it's based upon God's word. He's given it to us so that we can know how to live godly lives. We can know how to please Him and fulfill good works. He has breathed it for this purpose so that we can be converted unto Him and unto His ideology. The Word of God profits those who walk by faith. If someone reads the Word of God in a way that maybe you might have read through your calculus textbook. In other words, you don't really pay much attention. You just kind of like check the box. Hey, the teacher told me to read the first five paragraphs of chapter 13. I'm going to read the first five paragraphs, but I'm literally not going to in any way contemplate what it is actually being taught and said. I'm just going to transactionally read it. Well, then guess what? It doesn't profit anything. The Word of God profits the purpose of the Word of God in that it can convert the soul in that it can equip us for every good work, in that it corrects us, is only if it is mixed with faith as we read it. And the Hebrews writer explains this to us in Hebrews chapter 4 and in verse 2, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. And so if someone is going to read the word of God and just say, Oh, (laughs) chore done for the day. I read my Bible. It's not going to profit. It's not going to be of value. 
not going to do what it was purposed to do. And that's not because of a lack on God's part. That's because of a lack of the hearer or the reader's part. And we know that we walk by faith, not by sight. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. What does that mean? That means as I read God's Word and as I contemplate what it says and as it challenges my life, although I see X, Y, and Z physically in this life, I trust in God's Word because it is training me and teaching me regarding eternal life. And so I cleave to that instead of what I see, instead of what I feel, instead of what I want, I cleave to that which is in view of God's perspective. Remember, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10 and verse 17. I believe in that which I cannot see, but based upon the evidence of God's law, based upon what his word describes, I am convicted that it is true. I know that it is right. I trust in God, and therefore the seed's purpose is able to be achieved. I have a question. What is your relationship with the Word of God this morning? What is your relationship? What is my relationship with the seed that God has provided mankind? Is it disregarded? Is it overlooked? Is it stored in the cabinet somewhere? Sealed away in a plastic bag? Is it housed deep within the heart? Contemplated based upon eternal consequences and aspects? Well, that's what it's purposed to do. But that will only be achieved if we intend for that to be the purpose. How do you think about God's Word in your life Today, what is your relationship with the seed? We see the seed's purpose, but notice also that the seed is pure. Let's look at the seed's purity. You know, I've heard a lot of brethren before say that, you know, we just need to get the Bible out of the, you know, out of the picture. There's too much Bible involved. I've heard, I can't tell you how many brethren have held this view. You know what? That preacher, he preaches too much Bible. You know what? They, they just talk about the Bible all the time. They're just constantly engaged in Bible study. They're just constantly interested in memorizing more scriptures and more verses. And they fault the Bible when these kinds of comments are being made. That, that's not the Bible's fault. Now, indeed, people will do that and engage in that kind of behavior and then ignore what the Bible teaches. They'll have a poor attitude. They won't actually obey the Bible. They won't be engaging in their relationships in love and in charity and in uh, graciousness. Yes, that's a problem. But that's not the Bible's fault. The reason why that is occurring is not because of something that the seed has done. Again, that's the fault of the one consuming the seed. Uh, the seed is pure. Even you think about the Old Testament. Sometimes people will fault the Old Testament, like somehow the Old Testament was the reason as to why we find the condition that we do in the first century where Jesus is having to rebuke the Pharisees and rebuke the scribes and the Jewish leaders. That God's law under the Old Testament, the law of Moses was the problem. That it, it lacked in some way. No, that's not it at all. As a matter of fact, Paul will say this in a crystal clear way in Romans chapter 7 and in verse 12 he says wherefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good and this is in the context of contemplating the law of Moses the Old Testament law well what was the problem back then notice Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 7 for if that first covenant had been faultless then should no place have been sought for the second well what was the quote fault of the first covenant notice verse 8 for finding fault with them he said behold the days come saith the Lord when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah and so the old law God's Old Testament system was not problematic. It did exactly what it was intended to do, which was to bring mankind unto a knowledge of a need of Christ. And Paul explains this in Galatians chapter 3 and in verse 19, wherefore then serveth the law. It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come. And in that seed reference, by the way, verse 16 is a reference to 
Jesus Christ, the offspring of Abraham. Well, once Jesus came, we should know, uh, come to, to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of the mediator. Well, uh, the law was to bring about mankind to the point at which the Messiah was here. It did exactly what it was intended to do. The law itself is not the problem. Sometimes people will blame God's word. Well, God's word is the problem, they'll say. You know, people sometimes will use the Bible in ways that the Bible itself is very clear about in terms of uh, improper use. They will, as we've said before, hit people over the head with the Bible. They will yell at people in terms of Scripture. They will uh, respond in a retaliatory way, trying to throw verses here and throw verses there. And guess what? That's not the fault of God's truth. As a matter of fact, this is explained for us in James chapter 3. James chapter 3, notice beginning there in verse 14. James writes here, If ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. In other words, don't behave in a way that is filled with envy. Don't behave in a way that is filled with strife and argumentation and trying to just cause problems everywhere you go, and then blame that on the truth. You're lying against it. That's not the result of God's word. What is a result of? Wisdom that descends not from above, verse 15, it's earthly, sensual, devilish uh, wisdom. In other words, it's not actual godly wisdom. Verse 16, for where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. That's not a product. That's not an output of God's word. That comes from the world. Verse 17, what does the word of God produce? What is the wisdom that is from above? It's first pure. It's peaceable. It's gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. The seed is pure. We see the seed's purpose. We see the seed's purity. Let's look at the seed's power. We've already contemplated this to an extent. When you think about, again, Hiroshima, you think about the shot heard around the world, the Boston Massacre, you think about events that have taken place throughout history and wartime, great, powerful events to establish and sustain kingdoms. None of those compare to the Word of God. The seed is powerful. Hebrews chapter 4 explains this in verse 12. For the Word of God is quick and powerful. It's living. God's Word is living. Uh, it doesn't change and become altered, but it's, it itself is alive. And so when I take it in, what does it do? Well, It's like a two-edged sword. It pierces even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. In other words, it actually dissects who I am. It gets into my psyche, my self-concept, my lifestyle, and it begins to completely break it down. And how does it do that? Well, because when God's Word is applied to my mind and to my heart, it discerns the thoughts and intents of the heart. It actually defines what it is that I'm intending to do. I have a question. Why are you here this morning? Why did you make the decision to come here this morning? Was it to be right with God? Was it to be with God's family? Why is it that you are motivated to do what you do? Why do you say what you say? Why do you behave the way that you behave? What are your intents behind all of those things? Every day, we have a multitude of decisions, a plethora of decisions and and pathways before us to choose from. God's Word is able to break that down and identify why is it I'm doing what I'm doing? That's powerful. No psychologist, no counselor can do that. But God's Word can. 
And when that is recognized, there is nowhere else to turn. Why? Because we are dealing with He who is all-powerful. He who is omnipotent. He has given us His Word in order to get to the bottom, the root cause of our decisions and our life. We have a great example of the power of God's Word in the life of Paul. You think about Paul and what he was all about. Paul explains it to us in the book of Philippians in chapter 3. In verse 4 he says that, hey, he had every reason to have confidence based upon his former life. Verse 4. Verse 5, what was his pedigree? Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews as touching the law of Pharisee. Paul basically says he's the goat. When you break down these aspects that he's highlighting here, he is essentially making the case that as it relates to anything that was worthy of esteeming, worthy of high reputation under the Jewish system, under the law of Moses, Paul knocked it out of the park. He was the top of the top. And then because of that, verse 6, he was persecuting the church because of his zeal. He was blameless in terms of his allegiance to the law of Moses. He had it made. He had everything. He had influence. He had a reputation. He was the driving force in many ways behind the nation of Israel and their dedication and allegiance to upholding the law of Moses. But something happened. What happened? Let's go to Galatians chapter 1. Let's look there beginning in verse 13. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 13. He says, For I have heard, uh, for ye have heard of my conversation in time past. My lifetime, or my lifestyle in the past, as it relates to the Jews, beyond measure, Paul says, I persecuted the church of God and I wasted it. I profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of of my fathers, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace. What does the grace of God do? It teaches and instructs us, Titus chapter 2, verse 11 and following, to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years, I went to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. But other of the apostles saw I none save James, the Lord's brother. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God I lie not. Afterwards, I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea, which were in Christ. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed, and they glorified God in me. Paul's saying, hey, guess what? It was not because of the pressures or influences of other men as to why I am who I am today. We see Ananias telling Paul, and why tarriest thou, arise and be baptized, calling on the name of the Lord, Acts chapter 22 and verse 16. Paul had the gospel preached unto him, and he obeyed it. And the life then that he took on, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 and following, was a life filled with persecution and hardship. Why would someone who was living high on the hog, who was reaping all the benefits physically of the Jewish religion, was the top of the top, enjoying all the privileges and luxuries that came with it, throw all of that away? And take on a life filled with persecution. Well, Paul explains it actually, going back to Philippians chapter 3. In verse 7 and 8, he says, It's because he counted 
everything loss for Christ. As a matter of fact, he goes on and describes it that he counts them but dung that he may win Christ. In other words, it doesn't matter how great those things were physically. I wasn't right with God. And the word of God convicted Paul. So he turned around his life in order to be right with God and then took on a life filled with persecution and hardship. That's the power of God's word. The gospel is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. Uh, folks, Hiroshima was a wake up call for all of society. The various military events and moments throughout the histories of the kingdoms of men are fascinating and powerful. But none of it compares to the power of the eternal seed word of God. Why? Because it has the ability for us to humble our stubborn will and yield to our Creator, dedicating our entire lives to Him, no matter what the cost. The seed is powerful. The seed is also persistent. Let's look at the seed's persistence. It's persistent in the sense that God has a plan for His seed to constantly be planted and to constantly be watered. You think about that from a personal perspective. Paul will tell Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Personally speaking, God expects the seed to be persistent in our lives, constantly being fed the seed of the Word of God, constantly watering the Word of God personally in our lives. Well, you might say, well, that's hard. That requires discipline. That requires intentionality. That requires making up my mind that I'm actually going to put aside time during the day to do that. Notice the verse, 2 Timothy 2, verse 15. Give diligence. Apply effort, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Work is required. And God has established that for us personally, but he has also established that, the seed's persistence, from a congregational perspective. Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, we learn that on the first day of the week they come together, and what happens? Paul is preaching to them. Now, he continues his speech until midnight. We don't do that here, but Paul did that then. And on the first day of the week, we see the pattern, the apostolic framework for the church meeting on the first day of the week and having the Word of God declared, which is valuable and persisting in terms of the seed's power. I don't know about you, brethren, but you know, I, this morning in our Bible class, what a gift. What a gift. You couldn't pay me a billion dollars compared to what I got to experience this morning. Wow. Why? Because the most powerful source that we physically have access to in this world was shared through a multitude of perspectives intertwined together in the body of Christ to bring value to uphold and sustain faithful living. That's God's plan. God's plan is that we're able to come together to be fed. Verse 28 of Acts chapter 20. The overseers, the shepherds, the elders, what do they do? What are they charged with? Acts chapter 20, verse 28, to feed the church of God. What? The seed. <laughs> what a blessing. The seed is persistent in our personal lives as we continually study and in our congregational interaction with one another as we continually feast upon it together. As the elders see to it that we are fed as a congregation and as a sheepfold. 
But the seed is also persistent in that a willing heart yields sustained growth. You know, a seed is fascinating. You see the stages there of seed growth and development. And you contemplate what's taking place. A stalk is actually vertically growing from the ground, having penetrated the seed shell, having then persisted in its growth to then yield what it is potential and what it's capable of. Well, God's Word is able to do that. Luke chapter 8 and verse 15, a good and an honest heart is going to produce fruit. A willing heart yields to the Word of God, and the Word of God then begins to intersect within our set ways and mentalities, and we begin to question, and we begin to contemplate, and we begin to ask ourselves whether or not we have an answer. And it begins to take root. And it begins to persist within our minds. You know, when we were in Arequipa, I think we've said this to a few folks here, but one of the things that Carrie Gillis told us constantly while we were there, our job was to put other souls in the possession of the truth. Give souls an opportunity to have possession of the the truth. Why? Because the seed does what it's supposed to do. It persists. And as we begin to contemplate our life comparative to the Word of God, we begin to realize, I don't have an answer for this question. I need to change my life. I'm living in a way that I should not be living. I need to actually make a change. I need to do something differently. I need to take action. Because the seed is growing in my heart. The seed is persistent. And finally, the seed produces. Let's look at, contemplate the seed's production. Number one, the seed brings fruit for the master. In terms of our behavior, you think about what Paul explains to the Galatians as it relates to the fruit of the Spirit. In Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit laid out there for us, verses 22 through Uh, 23, all those traits and all those characteristics highlighted for us. And then you also contemplate what Jesus tells us in John chapter 15. It's recorded there, verses 1 through 6. That Jesus being the true vine, it is possible so that we can bear fruit as we abide in the vine. Verse 4, we're able to bring fruit to our master. But there's also heavenly destinations as it relates to the production of the seed. It's for others as we spread the seed, but it's also for ourselves as we heed to it. You think about what Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 16. He says, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. The production of the seed is to bring about fruit in our lives and is to yield a heavenly destination to be able to reign forever and ever with our Creator and our Maker. God's Word, the engrafted Word, is able to save our souls. James chapter 1 and verse 21. Uh, No other source is going to do that. No other source. Only the Word of God. What a blessing it is to have access to His gracious seed. Maybe you're here this morning and you're not yet a child of God. You've not yet made the decision to do just as Saul did in Acts chapter 22 and verse 16 as he was commanded by Ananias there to arise and be baptized, washing away his sins. Have you done that yet this morning? If not, you have the opportunity to do so. If you recognize that you have sin in your life, what is sin? It's a transgression of the law. If you have transgressed the law of God, And that means you are in a sinful situation. What is the wages of that? Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, His Son. What a blessing it is that we can obey the gospel and be baptized and have our sins washed away based upon our belief and confession in Him as we see exemplified in Acts 8, 34 through 39. If you're ready to do that this morning, we're here to assist you. Brother or sister, if you need to be restored, if you need prayers to the congregation, 
We hope that you'd come forward. We're here to help you in any way that we can. If you have any spiritual need, please come forward. It's all together. We stand and sing. There's a great day coming. A great day coming. There's a great day coming by and by.